He was jogging when it struck. Senator Slade Gorton hit by a heart attack. This is Cairo, News Channel 7 at 5. Good evening, everyone. Senator Gordon is in the hospital tonight after suffering a mild heart attack. The 66-year-old Gordon suffered chest pains as he was jogging this morning in the Boston suburbs. Our Washington Bureau Chief Mike Goldfein joins us now live with more. Mike? Well, Margaret and Steve, by all indications, Senator Gordon is in about as good a shape as one can be in tonight, uh, considering the fact that he has indeed suffered a heart attack. We are told that he is in completely stable condition, that he is pain-free, and that he is resting comfortably. The senator was taken to Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston by ambulance this morning. It is widely regarded as one of the best heart care hospitals in the nation. Gordon was in Boston visiting his two brothers and was out for a routine early morning jog. Relatives say that upon returning home, he felt pain in both his neck and chest and asked to see a doctor. An ambulance was called and Gordon, fully conscious, ended up in Massachusetts General's cardiac care unit. Certainly there are a lot of people who are worried about the senator. What can you tell us? Well, I can tell you that I talked to him today and he sounded like Slade. He was spunky, feisty, and complaining that he's in the hospital and he wants out. Um, obviously, we're concerned, um, but from everything that the doctors have told him and that he's passed on to us, that he's, he's fine, uh, he feels well, and he'll be out of the hospital in the next couple of days. That diagnosis could change possibly as more tests are to be run tomorrow. The senator's wife, Sally, is with him in Boston, as are many members of his family. Early speculation among the senator's staff, according to doctors, is that possibly a piece of artery-clogging uh, plaque may have broken loose and caused this heart attack. The senator was to stay in Boston another few days and then head on to Hawaii. Uh, it was all a purely, purely personal visit, but uh, even if doctors discharge him now in a day or two, he'll be in Boston for at least another two weeks, uh, Steve and Margaret, because they're not going to let him on an airplane. Mike, a quick question. Senator Gorton is such a health nut. Everybody knows that. Was there any kind of history for this kind of medical condition, or was it a total surprise? We are told, Margaret, that uh, he has had no history of heart problems. He is a health nut, but he isn't a health food nut. Uh, his staff and uh, people who know him know that he has a penchant for hamburgers, fries, and, uh, and uh, ice cream, and that's probably all going to change now. Mike, thanks. Senator Gorton's family knows their father's habits well, that good health is more than just a hobby to the senator. That's why they couldn't believe the news today. The Gordon's daughter says her father's spirits couldn't be better. She spoke with the senator by telephone late this afternoon. He's as fit as a fiddle. Um, I think, if anything, he just works too hard. Maybe, maybe that added a little bit to the stress. I couldn't keep the schedule that he does. Um, so maybe now this will slow him down a little bit, but I doubt it. She also confirmed that the senator will be undergoing an angioplasty as part of his test tomorrow. Also tonight, new developments in the smash-up of a car carrying three Seattle Seahawks in Kirkland last week. From the hospital, an update tonight on Mike Fryer, the paralyzed player in that wreck. But first, news about Seahawks star Chris Warren, the man police accuse of driving the vehicle. Cairo News has learned that Warren has taken a polygraph test to help prove his innocence. Cairo's Megan Black starts our team coverage. Chris Warren says playing Sunday in the Kingdom against the Colts helped him put aside the tragedy of the past few days, but the relief didn't last long. Warren's attorney hired an out-of-state expert to give the Seahawk a polygraph test early this morning. Warren answered four questions about who was driving. To each question, Chris gave an answer that was consistent with him being the passenger in the vehicle, and the results of the test indicated that he was not, attempt, not attempting deception, and in fact was being truthful when he said he was the passenger. Kirkland police arrested Warren the night of the accident, claiming that he was the driver. But Warren and the other Seahawk, Lamar Smith, have maintained that Smith was behind the wheel. Kirkland police say their initial investigation still points to Warren, but admit they are re-interviewing witnesses and talking with new ones who've come forward. You are not ruling out the possibility that Lamar Smith was behind the wheel? We are not ruling out any possibility. It is under investigation. Now, Kirkland police have filed for a search warrant to be able to get into the wrecked car. They hope to dust the steering wheel, among other things, for fingerprints, hoping to determine once and for all who was behind the wheel of the car when it crashed last Thursday night. Steve? Megan, let's straighten something out right now. You can't use a lie detector test in a court of law, correct? Correct, you cannot. However, the attorney says it is a tool of the investigation. Many times the police will ask for a polygraph test, and that is used to be a tool. They use that in combination with all the other evidence, and so this will 
be submitted as such. And the other question, why is it so important that police actually know who in fact was driving? Well, because Chris Warren was indeed arrested on suspicion of vehicular assault. If he wasn't driving the car, he can't be charged, and then the focus will shift on Lamar Smith. Smith did not receive a blood alcohol test at the scene because police didn't think at that time that he was the driver. And then Kirkland police have a whole other problem on their hands in this investigation. Sounds like they do. Megan, thank you. That was Megan Black live at Kirkland Police Headquarters. Well, now for the other half of the story. Cairo's Chris Lagaros is live at Overlake Hospital where he's heard from the doctor for paralyzed Seahawk Mike Fryer. Chris? Margaret, Mike Fryer is still in serious condition tonight here at Overlake Hospital, but his vital signs are stable. The doctors say what he needs most of all right now is rest. Seahawk Cortez Kennedy wanted to visit Mike Fryer at Overlake Hospital. He wanted to give the girlfriend of the injured player a comforting hug. He wanted to cradle Fryer's daughter in his massive arms. But only family members are allowed inside Fryer's hospital room and only for a few minutes each hour. He is um, under medication, is being sedated, so he's not conscious a lot of the time. We've not seen any improvement as it relates to movement of the hands or the legs. Mike Fryer's neck was broken in a car wreck last week. Doctors say he can bend his arms at the elbow, but he can't straighten them out. He has no finger motion, he has no motion in his legs. And Mike Fryer has no feeling below his belly button. His chances for walking are very poor. The football player also has pneumonia, which is common for patients who have trouble coughing up fluids. So the hospital is suctioning up those fluids for him while keeping his head and neck straight with the help of these skeletal and, uh, tongs. This, even though his neck is fused, I don't want my surgery undone by a bunch of coughing and jerking around. So while he's being suctioned frequently, we just leave him in traction to help hold his neck straight. Fryer's family has stayed silent about the accident and the player's injuries. The hospital says, quote, family members appreciate the prayers, care, and support they have received, but don't wish to talk to the public or be interviewed by the media. Doctors say that uh, one month from now, they'll have a better idea of how much of a recovery Mike Fryer will make. It is still very, very early. Margaret? Chris, how long do they expect Fryer to stay in the hospital? We heard two to four weeks today in the hospital, then possibly two to four months of rehabilitation after that, Margaret. Okay. Chris, thanks. Steve? There is one man tonight who very much wants to talk to Michael Fryer a little bit later on in this hour on Cairo News. The one thing he wants Fryer to know, the good news, if there can be any, out of this tragic story, that's just before 6 o'clock tonight right here on Cairo. But right now, the S word is back in the news tonight. That's right. It's snow, right? S-N-O-W. Yeah, right. that's right. Snow, a snow <laughs> advisory posted from Olympia to Bellingham. The National Weather Service forecasts one to two inches of snowfall. The South Sound area around Olympia could get it first, which means more snow on top of what's still left on the ground from last time. Cairo's Brian Wood has more. With a view of Mount Rainier like this, it's hard to think of the pain that comes with the pleasure of snow. The plows are busy in the Olympia area, keeping up with the five inches or more of snow that fell over the weekend and preparing for what could come tonight. We've been out since um, 1230 Friday night and um, we haven't stopped yet. We're ready for anything. We've got um, pretty much everything taken care of. Um, sand piles, stock piles, every, everything's ready to go. All day long, slick roads sent cars spinning. Linda Henderson ended up in the ditch this morning. It looked graveled and safe, and I just hit the ice and spun around and went over the curb. And here I've been sitting for an hour. <laughs> All the tow trucks are busy with other accidents. Accidents such as this one. The car smashed up, the driver fine, except for the handcuffs. He was arrested for suspicion of drunk driving and possession of marijuana. Record low temperatures are keeping utility crews busy. Scott Hull is a serviceman for Washington Natural Gas. Pilot outage or, or they'll have uh, some kind of electrical problem or thermostat problem. Schools in the Olympia area started classes an hour late. We caught up with the Rodriguez family, slipping and sliding to class this morning. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> and Vanessa and my daughter, they like it. You like it, Caroline? Mm -hmm. You and like you, it? You, Vanessa? It's good. You like it? Snow is good when you're making snowmen, women, children, or in this case, a snow dog. Brian Wood, Cairo News Channel 7. And here's some good news for you South Sounders. If we get more, the Olympia area may be first to get it again. Cairo's Deborah Horn is live on the Weather Patrol right now around Olympia tonight. Any signs of snow, Deborah? No, no signs of snow yet, at least no new snow. As Brian said, there's still some remnants of the snowstorm from yesterday. 
No new signs of snow and the roadways are pretty much clearer than they were a few hours ago. But it is cloudy and it is 32 degrees here. So if there is any precipitation, it could indeed fall as snow. All right, stay on top of it, Forge. We'll get back to you a little later this evening. Deborah, thanks. So our first check of the weather and Andy Wappler standing by. Andy? Well, Margaret, of course, the question for everybody is timing. When's it going to get here? And that really is kind of the question of the moment in the weather department, too. The thing is, as we can see in the satellite picture, we've had clouds over the state all day. But as the satellite goes into motion, you can see that things have kind of come in and Right about there, the front's sort of sitting off the coast. It's not charging in very quickly. It's kind of dribbling its way here, which is why people like Deborah down in the South Sound really aren't seeing that much snow yet. But they could see some as the evening goes on. There is a snow advisory for the lowlands of Western Washington today. And the thing of that is about an inch, maybe two. But the strange part of it is, as the weather comes in, that moisture off the Pacific, it's also going to be warmer. So some folks could see snow, say in the central Puget Sound, between maybe 10 to midnight, maybe 2 AM. And then things warm up, maybe turn to rain even by morning. So it could snow, then you wake up, it's rained, you might not even see it. Or, since the ground is cold, you could get a good glaze on the ground. We'll have more on that in just a few minutes, and the five-day forecast, too. Andy, thanks. Well, from the snow, certainly, to floods. Remember, not around here, though. Remember those devastating floods in the Midwest during the summer of 93? Today, a Missouri man got life in prison for causing one of them. That leads our look at World News tonight. James Scott admitted that he removed sandbags from a levee near West Quincy, Illinois, 18 months ago. That allowed the swollen Mississippi River to rush through, flooding some 14,000 acres of farmland and destroying scores of buildings. Scott told police that he wanted to make sure his wife couldn't return home across the river so that he could have affairs and party. President Clinton spent today in Budapest, Hungary, pressing world leaders for peace. The president witnessed the signing of a treaty which eliminates 9,000 long-range nuclear warheads in the U.S. and the former Soviet Union. He also called for peace in nearby Bosnia. An all-day search and night search finally turned up four teenagers missing near Santa Monica, California. They were exploring underground caves yesterday with a group of friends and apparently got lost. The four teens said they huddled together to keep warm. All are okay and say they don't plan to go caving again anytime soon. We have first pictures in tonight from on board that luxury cruise ship that burned and sank off the coast of East Africa last week. They were taken by one of the ship's crew and show the early stages of the disaster on board the Achille Lauro. Passengers quickly put on life jackets, then formed a bucket brigade to pass water up to the top deck to try to put out the fire. When that didn't work, they lined up to get off. Some of them shimmied down ropes to safety. Others boarded lifeboats on board ship, then braced for a very hard landing on the ocean below. Two people died in the blaze, and today, some of the nearly 1,000 passengers who survived complained that crew members scrambled to save themselves first. But the owners of the Achille Lauro deny that. A two-year-old girl is in Children's Hospital tonight in satisfactory condition, a victim of E. coli bacteria from contaminated salami. The salami was sold at supermarket delis and several King County QFC stores. So far, 15 people have been affected by the bacteria. The San Francisco sausage company that makes the product has recalled it. QFC has pulled it off its uh, deli shelves. Here is what you need to know tonight. Discard any salami product bought from the QFC deli before November 26th or return it to QFC for a full refund. And discard any Bongusto or Columbus brand salami purchased elsewhere. Now, if you think you might have symptoms of E. coli poisoning, that's fever, nausea, stomach ache, and diarrhea, call your doctor or your local health department. Well, let's see. How about uh, we do this? Better warn the Seahawk fan at your house that there's more bad news tonight. Starting quarterback Rick Meyer was hurt yesterday. Now Tony Ventrella has the decision on how long he'll be out. You won't like the answer. After fixing part of the Kingdome roof, would they really suddenly stop the project in the 530 half hour, see what they've decided? And it can balance your checkbook and let you play games. But next, health specialist Mickey Flowers shows you how your computer can actually help you feel better, too. You're watching Cairo, News Channel 7 at 5, with Steve Rabel, Margaret Larson, Harry Wappler's weather, and Tony Ventrella with sports. Not feeling too well? Well, now, instead of calling up a doctor, you can call up a computer program. 
Almost a third of the households in this country own a computer. That number is even higher in the Puget Sound area. And companies are combining health care with software to keep you hooked up and healthy. Cairo's health specialist Mickey Flowers now with the latest. Mickey. Steve, new computer programs are designed to help you keep track of your health needs. Whether it's finding out more about heart disease or the medicine you take, now you can turn to your computer for advice. Just a click of the mouse and you're inside Health Desk, an interactive Windows program with colorful graphics. You can do everything from tracking your family's health history to keeping track of your child's vaccinations. We asked family doctor Bruce Gardner to take a look at a couple of the programs available. He says they can be helpful. It's an awareness issue, I think. It helps people understand when their health is risky, when their health problems are safe to treat at home. For example, you can find out what the symptoms are for a urinary tract infection. And there's information on how you can treat it at home. The Mayo Clinic Home Pharmacist is a Windows CD-ROM program. This one lets you find out what kind of medicine to take for certain symptoms. But beware. Dr. Gardner says there is a drawback to these programs. Basic information is dependable. But what is not dependable is they are not diagnostic tools. So don't try to diagnose yourself at home. Sometimes it's essential to see a doctor. If you really had a question that required some insight or perhaps uh, a gentle touch or perhaps someone who's willing to make a hard decision, then I think there's no substitute for calling the doctor's office. Dr. Gardner says knowing more about your health can only help you when you do have to go to the doctor. Some programs guide you through symptoms with questions of how you're feeling. So you don't forget them, you can take a printout with you to the doctor. And how much would one expect to pay for one of these computer health programs? Oh, somewhere between $40 and $60. So they're cheap, but they're helpful. They're helpful. Yep. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And what would the holidays be if folks weren't suing each other over how they celebrate? First up, remember last year we showed you this huge light show in Little Rock, Arkansas? Neighbors went to court demanding that the family unplug some of their three million lights. Oh well, today, Arkansas Supreme Court agreed the lights are too bright, the traffic is too much, <laughs> and the family has to cut back the display. And the courts are also just now deciding about Halloween. The U.S. Supreme Court is allowing public schools to continue Halloween celebrations. The court tossed out a Florida man's lawsuit claiming witches and brooms and other Halloween symbols violate the separation of church and state. It sounded more like a football pep rally than a Republican caucus. Listen as the new GOP majority in Congress elected its Speaker of the House today. That's Newt, 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 they're saying. The vote unanimous for Georgia's Newt Gingrich. But if the White House staff had voted, Gingrich would have been out on his ear. He riled them up by accusing a court by a crew. Let me start over there. He riled them up by accusing a quarter of the president's staff of using drugs. He's not the editor of a cheap tabloid. He's not just a, uh, an out-of-control radio talk show host. He is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and he's got to learn to behave as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Panetta says all White House staffers have to pass stringent drug tests. He challenged Gingrich to institute the same policy on Capitol Hill. Two other politicians also making news tonight. First, Treasury Secretary Lloyd Benson says talk of his resignation is premature, but at the same time, he's not denying reports that he'll leave office early next year to go into business in Texas. And former Vice President Dan Quayle is responding well to the medication for his blood clots, but not quite as well as doctors had expected. So he did not go home from the hospital today, perhaps tomorrow. And coming up next, that four-letter word is back in our news. We spelled it so well I before. Did. Do you think I can do it or you I want to? I think you can. S-N-O-W. Yeah, Andy Wappler shows us how much more we're going to get. <laughs> and that other four-letter word, T-O-N-Y, <laughs> joins us now for the sports. Don't take it in vain. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How Hi. are you guys? Hi. Uh, Seahawks with a rough uh, last couple days, as you know. Then they lost the game. And then they lost their quarterback for the rest of the season. Rick Meyer with a broken thumb. Back with sports in a few minutes. Double clutch there for a minute. That <laughs> 21 you? is exactly what I thought it was. That's cold. It is very. cold. In these parts, that's very cold. It is. And Olympia even got down to 12. And using the Ventrella system, I can tell you it got to <laughs> 2. 
at Colville this morning. Wow. Almost not even worth measuring when there's only two of them, isn't it? But it is cold outside and still kind of cold outside right now. We'll go into the eye of the needle into the mid-30s right now in most parts of the Puget Sound area and fairly clear, although there is a pretty good-sized cloud deck that's building, but it's way above us at this point and hasn't yet brought us any snow, but it could. But it could, he said, which I guess is the word that everybody is looking for. And as we go now into the computer, we can see how the temperatures are stacking up around the state. Anywhere from 29 at Bellingham to 39 on the coast. It's warmer there because the moisture is starting to come in. And what could happen to bring snow is as it comes our way, hopefully the land and the air that's still here is cold enough to produce snow. I guess that's if you're 12 and under and you're hoping for snow. And for the rest of us, hopefully it's warm enough that it won't produce any snow. And unfortunately, we're right kind of on that line in between the two. The satellite picture shows the high cloud deck but the gray that's kind of in it right now shows that the clouds that are there aren't really very thick and haven't produced any moisture, which is why today has really been basically pretty dry and was dry down the South Sound earlier as we saw where Deborah Horn was. But here's the system that's coming in and it's just kind of stalling a bit off the coast. What will probably happen is that it will come in, bring a little bit of snow to say the Olympia and South Sound areas, maybe between six and eight tonight, then kind of keep moving up, maybe bring snow to Seattle between 10 to midnight and also then bring warmer temperatures as the evening goes on. And around the country, a lot of people are hoping for warmer temperatures. Williston, North Dakota this morning, 28 degrees below. Really cold there, a lot of snow in the middle of the country. And what's amazing too, if you look here on the national map, we can see where the temperatures are around the rest of the country. Records were being set. Not only was it below zero, 28 below in Williston, North Dakota today, down in Florida, records in Apalachicola, Jacksonville and other parts of Florida, anywhere from 78 to 82 there, and also a record at Kennedy Airport today, 62 degrees. Now tomorrow, as this map shows, things are going to be a little bit more back to normal, but still into the mid-50s in New York, and still into the single digits for most of the north part of North Dakota, South Dakota, and everywhere in the Upper Plains. In our area, cold too into the mountains. Not really a lot of snow tonight and tomorrow, but the thing to watch out if you're traveling is, it will be windy into the mountains, so what snow does fall will be blowing, will make visibility tough, and of course will be icy. The winds anywhere from 25 miles an hour or above, and the afternoon temperatures only into the mid-20s, so very chilly into the mountains. Be careful if you're driving. Be ready in case you have to be stuck. Tonight for our area, we have a snow advisory, only an inch or two, and really kind of right on the edge right now of rain or snow. And again, on the timing, probably in the central Puget Sound area within a few hours of midnight, say between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, and then as the evening goes on, the lows may be as high as 35 tonight, so it could potentially snow and then rain on that snow and wash it away by morning. We'll have to see how that goes. Definitely things will wash away by the middle of the day, starting out with rain, going into showers, highs into the upper 30s finally, which will seem relatively warm after the three record and setter days that we've seen in the last few. And into the five-day forecast, chance of rain or snow for the next couple days, some fog on Thursday, and then back to kind of a rainy and slightly warmer pattern, if you call 40s and 33s warm, for the next five days. Andy, thanks a lot. Coming up on Cairo News at 5.30, imagine what a hard job this must be. Tracking down the biggest killer of babies in this state, adults. This is Cairo, News Channel 7 at 5. If you are joining us for our second half hour, let's take a look at some of the stories that made headlines at 5 o'clock. Senator Slade Gordon had a mild heart attack today while jogging in Boston. The 66-year-old senator is recovering at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is reported in stable condition and said to be pain-free. Word in tonight that Seattle Seahawk running back Chris Warren has taken and, according to his attorney, passed a lie detector test. Kirkland police accused Warren of being behind the wheel the night three Seahawks crashed their car into a utility pole. Warren took the polygraph test to help prove that he was not the driver. And more wintry weather is on the way. Look for snow to start in the south and move north, possibly hitting Seattle by midnight. Andy Wappler says to look for about an inch of snow, two inches tops. The trial of the Seusses, the husband and wife accused in the scalding death of their baby, has put that issue back in the headlines again. The legal term is infanticide, intentionally killing a baby. It is the single biggest cause of death for babies in this state. And then consider the cases of abuse in which the baby does not die, and the total number is staggering. Tonight, Cairo's Julie Blacklow and two people who work in this world of abuse every day. What happened there? Oh, it looks like the ribs may be fractured on that side. 
broken ribs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the skeleton of a baby who died from a beating. One of a growing number of what King County Medical Examiner Donald Ray calls the really innocent victims. He and his staff are, arguably, the only voice these victims will ever have. And the best thing we can do for these, for these infants and children is to do a good autopsy, to make sure that we, 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 we can be their advocate when, when the time is appropriate that we can say, hey, this is what happened. Research shows some of the key factors often associated with infant abuse are young mothers, lack of education, low birth weight, unmarried mothers, and late or no prenatal care. It doesn't lend itself to, to easy understanding aside from the fact that uh, we all have our, our frustrations, anxieties, and then, then you layer that with alcohol and drugs and, and perhaps poverty and uh, you know very poor social structure, and you have an explosion that goes on. The explosion doesn't go out on the street, it goes on in the bedroom, it goes on in the crib. Dr. Ray points out that advances in medical function. technology save hundreds of abuse victims from death. Many come through the doors of Harborview's emergency room. Health care workers are now trained to recognize signs of abuse, and new laws make it mandatory to report such cases to authorities. Nothing surprises me anymore with regard to family violence and, and child abuse, but it sure makes my heart heavy. Harborview's director of social work, Carol Klingbeil, has trained many of Harborview's doctors herself and has worked in the child abuse field for 25 years. The fact that there are now more than a million reported cases of child abuse every year in this country has some basic root causes. How one learns to parent, how one learns to bond, is passed on from generation to generation. So if you don't learn it in one generation, you're liable to pass on that ill preparedness or ill parenting to your kids. And we're creating a nation of parents or adults who are very ill prepared to be parents. Not good. Klingbill says research indicates 80% of American parents use some form of corporal punishment with their children, from a light smack on the rear to the extreme. In this case, a five-year-old child was beaten and had her leg broken to keep her in her bed. And I think that it gives the absolute wrong message. Which is? Which is that if I love you, I can hurt you. As appalled as Klingbeil is about the extent of the infant and child abuse crisis, she says it's a preventable problem with better health and child care and, most importantly, an admission from the parent that they want to get help. Julie Blacklow, Cairo, News Channel 7. One place to turn for help is Parents Anonymous. The phone number for their family helpline is 1-800-932-HOPE, H-O-P-E. Much of their emphasis is on prevention, and they help hundreds of families before a catastrophe occurs. And because of the stress during the holidays, there's often an increase in family violence at this time of year, so that phone number becomes even more important. A new development tonight in the case of a woman who says she was gang raped by Cincinnati Bengals football players in a Seattle area hotel. An appeals court says that Victoria Kreitzer cannot sue the players for damages, but her children can. Kreitzer says the rape happened here at the Doubletree Hotel in Tukwila, that she was raped by 12 football players after she had consensual sex with a member of the team. The players denied the rape charge, and last year a court ruled that a $30,000 settlement she accepted barred her from suing team members. But an appeals court decided today that her children can sue the players for allegedly harming their parental relationship. As attorneys continue the painstaking task of picking a jury for the O.J. Simpson trial, news tonight that one of the jurors already chosen may be bounced. We don't know why it happened, but District Attorney Marsha Clark announced today that the original jury may be down to 11 members, that a juror could be excused for misconduct. A hearing on the matter is set for Thursday. A father and son are doing okay tonight after their airplane crashed in a most unusual place, the Elk Run Golf Course in Maple Valley. Investigators still don't know why the single-engine craft came down in a pond on the course yesterday afternoon. The plane's pretty banged up with a cracked wing, blown windshield, and bent propellers. Pilot Winfred Benton and his son Dan were much luckier. They're both hospitalized in satisfactory condition. And apparently it just wasn't a good weekend for any kind of flying. A Portland man was hurt while he was paragliding off a bridge near Mount St. Helens. Witnesses say his chute started spinning and he fell into the rocks at the base of the bridge. He is reported in serious condition tonight. 
A Washington state man who was badly burned in the crash of his General Motors pickup truck lashed out today at the federal government for deciding not to recall those vehicles. He joined with consumer groups in Washington, D.C. to protest the decision and to release documents showing that General Motors has known about the defect for 20 years. Our Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief Mike Goldfein reports. It was in this pickup that Doug Warden's life forever changed. Two years ago, in Puyallup, his 1978 GM truck was hit broadside. The side-mounted gas tank ruptured and exploded into a ball of flames. You're getting stronger. You're getting stronger. Warden spent months in Harborview undergoing painful rehabilitation. This week, in Washington, he was to testify at a Department of Transportation hearing on whether the trucks, in which more than 1,000 people have died, should be recalled. But on Friday, Transportation Secretary Pena scrapped the hearing, accepting instead a $51 million check from General Motors to fund highway safety programs. I was not surprised that Jim did not want to see my burned face. Allowing GM to bankroll a government research laboratory on fire safety is like putting the arsonist in charge of the fire department. Consumer groups today allege that General Motors has known about the defect in side-mounted fuel tanks for years on trucks made between 1973 and 1987. When General Motors first designed these vehicles, they knew they were unsafe, and they know it today. And court documents made public today for the first time seem to back that up. In 1973, GM crash-tested a tank fitted with a protective shield, which did not rupture. And in 1984, a GM vice president drew this sketch of another shield and wrote, a probable easy fix. The only thing that a GM uh, pickup owner can do is put a bumper sticker on the side of their uh, truck saying, steer clear, GM firebomb. You're personally outraged by this deal, I take it. Uh, I guess more heart sick than outraged. Consumer groups are suing the government to stop the multi-million dollar deal with General Motors. The car company issued a statement today which did not deny the allegations, but went on to say they're nothing new. In Washington, Mike Goldfein, Cairo News Channel 7. Fire destroyed a house in Southern California over the weekend, but it turned out not to be your average house. The house belonged to cats, and 10 of them died in the fire. They were some of the 13 cats that inherited the house when the owner died last year. Her will paid for the cats to live alone in the 1,100 square foot house. The power stayed on and a gardener mowed the lawn. No word yet on what started the fire, but the animals will be buried in a pet cemetery. Coming up, the news that Seahawks fans did not want to hear. Tony Ventrella has it next on Cairo News. Their number one quarterback is out. Can the Hawks win with Dan McGuire at the helm Sunday in Houston? Stay tuned. Tony's here with a look at sports and two losses for the Seahawks, the game and the quarterback. Well, as if the last few days uh, haven't been tough enough for the Seahawks, their players, their fans. The Seahawks lost to the Colts 31-19 yesterday in a game you heard uh, right here in Cairo uh, Radio, in fact, uh, yesterday. They also lost starting quarterback Rick Meyer probably for the rest of the season. Now, Meyer was injured trying to tackle Ray Buchanan as he was running back an interception for a touchdown. Jason Belzer stepped on Rick's left thumb and broke it. Meyer had surgery on the thumb this afternoon. Coach Flores talked about Rick's season after the surgery. Well, I think he's had a frustrating season. It hasn't been uh, that remarkable, I don't think, compared to what, I mean, as to what everybody expected. Uh, obviously, we wanted him to have a better season because that, if a quarterback has a good season, then the team usually has a much better season. But, but uh, we haven't. And so with Meyer on the sidelines, the Seahawks will go with Dan McGuire against the Oilers on Sunday, a 1-12 team. He had a rough time yesterday. Twice he lost fumbles deep in Seattle territory, also threw an interception. He did throw a touchdown pass to Steve Smith late in the game, but at that point it was all but over. The Seahawks' other quarterback is Stan Gelbaugh. He will now be the backup to Dan McGuire. Well, the Seahawks weren't the only AFC West team to lose a quarterback. But uh, they just lost theirs for one game. John Elway went down with a knee injury. It seemed worse at first. They were playing the Chiefs. Elway was hurt on this play in the fourth quarter. The Broncos went over the Chiefs. Fortunately for the Broncos, it was only a strained muscle behind the knee. He is questionable for Sunday's game with the Raiders. Elway's backup, of course, is former Husky Hugh Millen. I, I certainly know my place here and, and, and know that, you know, obviously, obviously that I, I got to be in it ready to play uh, at any time. He, he'll be questionable this week, but, but it depends on how quickly he responds to treatment. So it's, it's a lot better than we thought. 
Pretty good AFC game tonight. The Raiders and Chargers get together on Monday Night Football. Basketball news, the Sonics are on a roll. They'll be going after number six in a row when they take on the Rockets tomorrow night at the Tacoma Dome at 7 o'clock. It'll be the second game between these two teams this season. About 10 days ago, the Sonics beat the world champs on their home court thanks to this clutch jump shot by Gary Payton. Payton's been terrific during the Sonics winning streak. He explains now, and his answer might confuse you. I'm not thinking about nothing, you know, I, just, uh, I, I put myself in a room by myself and talk to myself, you know, um, I can't come out there being confused or doing anything, I got to come out there and play, you know, if I be confused, it's going to make the whole team look confused, so if I come out and try to play hard, everybody's going to follow the lead and it, it's going to happen, and, uh, you know, that's all I'm doing, um, I can't confuse myself, I just got to come out and play. So many it's actually very clear to me. In Portland last night, a wild finish in the game between the Blazers and the Bucks. Only nine tenths of a second left. Milwaukee's Ben Baker ties it up to the three-pointer from 24 feet away. All right, so Portland had one last chance with nine tenths of a second. Clyde Drexler, oh yeah, there it is off the glass. He banks it in over the outstretch arms of Marty Conlon. The Blazers win it over the Bucks, 105 to 103. You may have heard about the big dunk that took place in a ball game over the weekend. No, I'm not talking about one of Sean Kemp's jams, but a woman on North Carolina's team, Charlotte Smith of the Tar Heels, became the first woman in 10 years to dunk a basketball during a game. The jam came against North Carolina A&T. Smith is a six-footer, and as you can see, clearly dunks with her right hand while clearing the rim. Right there, she hit a jump shot. She can do that, too. On the Seattle University campus, the women's team was practicing this morning, getting ready for their big game against Seattle Pacific tomorrow night. The Chieftain players had heard about the dunk. That's impressive. <laughs> it's very impressive. If you can do it, do it. <laughs> yeah, it brings a lot to women's basketball to know that there are women out there who can do that and something to strive for. I haven't seen it, but I mean, it's wonderful. I heard she was like six feet tall. That's great. Maybe I have hope. <laughs> It, it impresses me a little bit. I spent this summer a, a little bit with uh, a girl by the name of Lisa Leslie, plays for USC, and uh, she puts it down real good. She puts it down frontwards and backwards, and uh, uh, they're talking about the, the girl from North Carolina, but uh, look out, because the girl from USC, uh, I think she'll be uh, dunking by the end of this season. All right, a big weekend in Hamilton, Ontario. The Canadian Figure Skating Championships. Now the silver medalist in the pairs competition, Canada's Lloyd Eisler and Isabel Broser. After the competition ended, they treated the crowd to a little surprise. <laughs> yeah, Lloyd and Il Isabel, or is it uh, Isabel and Lloyd, or Lloyd and Isabel, but anyway, you know, they did that in Tacoma last June, did they? and it, it was just a great show. Obviously, they're a, a legit Paris skating team that does all the competition the way you're expected to by the yep. judges, but then after that's over, they have the exhibition, come out and do that. They just uh, brought the house down at Pretty the Tacoma Dome last year. And he was fetching in that I outfit. Absolutely. I thought he really was lovely, really nice. yes. Yeah. Great legs. And that little double spin. Whatever that was. Whatever the heck that was. was. Pretty good. <laughs> Tony, thank you. See you later. Well, snow by morning. Coming up, our Andy Wappler has that and the forecast all the way into the weekend. Come on back. The man in charge of King Dome repairs admitted today that there may be more cost overruns to come. The King County Council today appropriated $18.5 million to keep the Kingdom repairs on track, but council members could not win any guarantees that this will be the last of the cost overruns. Cairo's government specialist Essex Porter has the story. The Kingdom repairs were supposed to cost $32.5 million. Instead, they'll cost at least $51 million. The repairs were supposed to be done by November. Now the roof won't be finished until March. So King County Council members wanted to vent their frustrations before voting 10 to 3 to approve $18.5 million to cover cost overruns. I, f I feel like I'm a uh, involuntary passenger on a train that's out of control. And it is about as frustrating an issue I've ever had in public office. Interim Kingdom Director Dick Sandus was their target. Can he guarantee he won't have to come back to ask for even more money? I can't guarantee a number. This is a this is a mega remodeling job with a lot of unknowns, and we're st we're we're not 
through that entirely yet. We're mostly through that, but now we're into the weather unknowns and we're into some other unknowns. Why do this today and now, and why don't you wait until we've got it all figured out and ask this council for one more appropriation instead of coming back again and again and again? The issue is not whether you're going to be under 18.5 or over 18.5. No matter what scenario you pay, we, it will cost taxpayers more money not to act on this ordinance. Sandus has already today, spent $5 million he, he didn't have. It would cost $2 million just to shut it down. And King County Executive Gary Locke says he ordered work to continue with the informal approval of county council members. Uh, they encouraged us and told us, do not slow it down, do not shut it down, uh, that eventually we would get some or all of the $18.5 million. And there are no guarantees from Locke either that $51 million will be enough to fix the dome. In Seattle, Essex, Porter Cairo, News Channel 7. Essex tells us that project managers looked at the idea of stopping the roof work and asking for lower bids, but they say the cost of stopping the work on the Kingdom would exceed any potential savings. Andy Wappler is tracking all the various storms heading in all the various directions tonight, and he has an update for us now. Andy? Well, tracking we are, Margaret, and kind of the good news right now if you're a driver is there isn't much yet to track, and hopefully things will stay that way. In our area, 36 degrees downtown here at Cairo, although that really puts us kind of in the banana belt, so to speak, at this point. 30 degrees right now in Olympia and 29 at Bellingham, and those are two places that are likely to get snow first if anybody does, in fact, get it and I think there's a good chance they will. We can see on the satellite picture there's a fairly weak system out here on the coast, but since it has been so cold when the moisture comes down, it is likely to fall as snow, probably around anywhere from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock in the South Sound, more like, say, 10 o'clock in the North Sound, and around midnight here in the central area, Seattle, Bellevue, places like that. Tonight, look for one to two inches of snow, and there is a snow advisory. The thing is, though, we're also going to see lows that are warmer than they've been over the last couple days, perhaps by 10 to 15 degrees warmer. So what could start as snow may even end by rain by morning. And over the next five days, though, even if we miss it now, we're going to come up to bat here again. We have rain or snow on the next couple of days before finally by Friday and Saturday, we maybe get all the way up to the 40s and up to at least the mid-30s for our lows. All the way up to the 40s. How encouraging. Wow. Fall me out there <laughs> almost. <laughs> Suntan weather. Uh, thanks, Andy. <laughs> you heard about the Seahawk player, of course, left paralyzed by that car wreck. But you haven't heard from the man who wants to talk to that injured player. We'll have more from him next.